to some fluid management talks, and the first talk is going to be by Michael Sulin from um, Penn, who's going to speak on the management of ascites. So when Gary asked me to come talk to you all about ascites, I cannot say that enthusiasm was the first emotion that came to mind. But I actually had a lot of fun putting together this talk. Um, that's actually my nanny who's pregnant. That's not actually ascites in the picture, but just anyway. So why you should care about ascites management. Um, I went back into our high IQ database for the last uh, two complete calendar years, the first quarter of this year, just to see how much of this we did. So over 500 paracentesis a year and well ahead of schedule for the first quarter of this year um, versus the number of tips we do, uh, number of tunnel perineal catheters we put in, and the number of Denver shunts we put in. So overall, you can see that about 35% of our frequent flyers get converted from large volume paracentesis to some more durable form of management of their ascites, which is not a tremendously high number. This is the other reason you should care, is because basically you don't get paid squat for doing this. All right, so your reimbursement, if you do it in a hospital setting for a paracentesis, is about 100 bucks. For a tunnel peritoneal catheter, it's about 200 bucks. On the other hand, if you do a TIPS or a Denver shunt, you get paid very well if you do this, even in the hospital setting. So, so the take home message is that you lose money every time you do a paracentesis or a tunnel peritoneal catheter, and you make money every time you do a TIPS or a Denver shunt. So what causes ascites? Almost all our patients are cirrhotic, and they live on average of about two years. Um, about 10% will have malignant ascites, and they have a very short survival, and this affects the decisions you make about how you manage their ascites, because they only don't, don't have to manage it for very long. Um, and then 10% of patients have various other weird causes for their ascites. For the cancer patients, it's mostly epithelial cancers, but they're a mixed cause of etiology. So Half or more will actually be due to carcinomatosis, so truly malignant ascites, but the rest may be have non-malignant ascites in the setting of cancer, so massive, massive liver mets, underlying portal hypertension in HCC patients, so it actually has nothing to do with the cancer per se, a mixture of the two, and then you have some patients that have chylus ascites from lymphatic obstruction. So how do you figure this all out? You need a serum albumin, you need a urinary sodium, and you need to tap them. And on your diagnostic tap, you look at cell counts, you do a gram stain to make sure they're not infected, you get chemistry levels, and you do cytology. And cytology is 97% sensitive for carcinomatosis. So if you have malignant cells, if it's malignant ascites, you'll probably get the diagnosis off your a single tap for ascites cytology. And then you look at your serum ascites albumin gradient, or the SOG gradient. And basically, if your serum albumin level is 1.1 grams per deciliter higher than your, than your ascites level, that 97% predicts that this is portal hypertensive ascites and not you know, ascites from some other cause. Treatment in most patients is diet and diuresis for non-malignant ascites. So salt restriction, you should have a liver diet guide in your clinic. We have liver diet guides for both low protein and low salt diets, which you have to 